Good morning. Good morning. God has been good to us again. We are should be extremely thankful that God has blessed us to come to this place and corporately worship Him in spirit and in truth. Again, want to welcome all of those visitors that are with us, especially those who may be first-time guests. Don't see anybody, any first-time guests. I'm going to quit qualifying this probably after this month. First time since I've been here. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that we give you a gift um, if it is your first time um, since you have been being here with us either in person or in fact those who are enjoying our live stream, uh, which is picking up steam by the way, and I'm going to prepare a report. I keep saying that. I need to go ahead and do that. Um, because you need to know that not only are we increasing the footprint here for the church locally, but we're also doing that on uh, on social media. And I, I am going to give myself a target date when I'm, I'm going to have that actually done. So uh, again, welcome to those visitors, and especially those um, faithful members of the Trent congregation um, who really, you, you help keep the lights on, and you help keep the gas on, and you, keep, you help keep everything moving forward with this particular congregation. The more people I talk to and the more I get acclimated to this area, and then also back in Abilene, people know of this church. Um, they're really coming to know us now, especially um, as a result of our, our live stream in our social media presence. And so we want to continue to ask you to pray. Uh, for those who are on the prayer list, I'm going to add uh, my mother. I didn't do that formally, but please uh, remember Sally Famble in your prayer. She is um, struggling in her health. And uh, I'm trying to get something out of my eye. I'm terribly sorry. Mm -hmm. um, she's struggling in her health, and let's just remember to pray um, for her. She is diabetic and is adjusting some things with that as well. Today is the last Sunday of the month, and let's finish what we've been talking about really all this month, um, living in love with God. And I hope, it's been my sincere hope, that you've gotten from this series that, that really, kind of like, like Elvis, if you will, church needs to leave the building. We don't need to think about church just on Sunday or just on Wednesday or just on Saturday. I hope that you've gotten from this series that my relationship with God, your relationship with God, it is a love affair that should happen and should be thought of and should be cultivated every single day of our lives. And this lessons from Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we've been looking at Really, the, the, as the, the original word in, in, in the Hebrew language is Shema, it simply means to hear, to focus. Hopefully, Deuteronomy 6 has given you some insight on some things that we can put into our lives every day to live in love with God. And I've really been trying to address the idea or this myth Nobody here believes this myth, but this generally believed myth that you only need to think about God twice a week because that's all you go to church. No, that's not right, and that is wrong. And the Bible and Scripture doesn't support that. We talked about in the beginning that faith was a lifestyle decision. Then we talked about uh, the fact that our love affair with God requires a good memory. Why? Because God takes care of us and does things for us whether we are conscious of them or not. And, and, and the old preachers used to say, God is better to me than I've been to myself. And so we need to always be mindful of our relationship with him. Third week, we talked about um, the fact that our relationship with God demands fear. Not fear out of cowardice, fear out of awesome respect for who God is and for what God does. And then today... Let's finish Deuteronomy 6. And let's talk about this, this living in love with God for the sake of obedience. And before we get into it, uh, those of you who haven't turned me off yet, we don't like that word obey in our culture. We really don't. But I dare you. I double dog dare you. Those who have a mortgage, don't pay it for a couple of months to see what happens. Okay, you don't like that? Let me try another one. Those who are still making a car payment, okay, don't pay it for a couple of months and then call me and see what happens. Okay? No. Everything that we do in our lives 
requires some obedience. When you sign that bill or you make that note or you do that payment, you have said you will give them a check once a month or whatever it is, and every means every. You don't, you don't believe me? Miss one. They might let you buy. Miss two, they're going to call you. Miss three, you're going to get a knock on the door. Okay? So we don't like that word obey, but in our relationship with God, it's a good word because God is sovereign. And who God is in, in our relationship with Him demands, demands obedience. And we'll talk about that in just a second. God's love, as I've been saying, <coughs> All this month is a motivating force behind everything that he does. Listen, there is nothing that you can do that will separate God's love for you, God's love for me. Jesus said it best in John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said, I come to this earth that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Everything that we do is about God's love and there is no end to God's love. It reaches you wherever you are, and in spite of me, you know what? God still loves me. So let's finish this month. Let's talk about obedience. And I'm calling this one God's love language. Again, we'll look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. We'll skip down to verse 17 through verse 19. And then we'll get to the end of chapter 6 with verse 24 and verse 25. Here's the reading. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Again, the Hebrew Shema simply means to hear, to listen, to focus. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Jesus comes in Mark 12. I told you this before. He adds the word mind. Dropping to verse 17. Now we talk about obedience. This is, this is what we should do in verse 4, verse 5. 17 through 19, and then verse 24 and 25 is why you should do it. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees that he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight. Why? So that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord has promised and over. On your ends to your ancestors and thrusting out all of your enemies before you as the Lord God has said look at the beginning of verse 17 be sure you know whenever I used to get let me start with prayer before I get too far in let's pray <coughs> father in heaven thank you Lord for all of your blessings we are so thankful for the ability and the blessing to come here and to worship corporately Lord, to do two things, to encourage each other, and Lord, to remember the commands of worship that you've said, to sing songs and to gather around your table and, and, and to give and to hear your word preached, all for the express purpose of giving our praise and our adoration to you. Bless those who are on the sick list and help us always to be mindful of those in our community, those in our family, those in the area that we can help and we can serve, not for our own glory, but Lord, for yours. Forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. We thank you and we love you for this and all your blessings. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Verse 17 says, it starts off with two simple words, be sure. And if you've ever run errands for your parents, you heard those two words or some combination of those two words. I used to run to the neighborhood store, not unlike what we have here, and, 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 and do get this, and be sure and get this, get this. Oh, and Junior, be sure and get. Well, that was the very first thing you had to get. Because if you forgot it, boy, there was going to be some trouble. God gives this almost as the ultimate good parent. This is what I want you to do, and I brought you through all of this. Now, be sure to do this. And the idea of obedience, I don't know what it is with us, and we've made that word or the hearing of that word a bad word, but when a good parent tells you to be sure to do something, it's not because they're trying to come down on you. They want you to remember this, especially when it comes to life 
lessons. Be sure, verse 17 says, be sure to keep the commands. I remember being away from home for the first time coming to school in Texas. I tell this, this story quite a bit. I'm not a native Texan, but I got here as quickly as I could. <laughs> I remember coming to Texas and being on my own um, in Terrell, actually, at, at, at school. And I just remember thinking, I know everything. And, and, and my parents know nothing <laughs> until the first time I ran out of money. <laughs> and I had to make a phone call. And really, um, my, my first little bit at, at school at Southwestern, I really called my mom and I contemplated uh, not coming back second semester. I did. I was like, oh, I cannot. You have to understand, coming from Atlanta, Georgia, to Terrell, Texas, if you know the... Let me try it again. Coming from Atlanta, Georgia, to Terrell, Texas, I had some adjusting to do. And I, I talked to my mom, and I said, Mom, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it. You know, they got, they got guns on the back of trucks riding around, and, and they listen to funny songs on the radio. I think it's AM. I didn't know the radio had an AM side back there. And I was just bemoaning to my mom and bemoaning and bemoaning. She said, okay, Junior, well, you know, you can, you can come home, you know. But uh, I've never known you to quit anything in your life. I said, what? Uh, what, what did she say? <laughs> what she was really trying to tell me is be sure to remember how I raised you. And she used to say it all the time. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. And you're going to hit certain circumstances in your life. You just got to tighten your belt and get through it. God is saying here, be sure to remember <laughs> Everything that I've done for you, be sure to remember it because we have a nasty habit of remembering, kind of like my children, remembering what we want to remember and we forget how good we had it. You know, I took for granted water until that week, 10 days, you said we went without and pipes froze and I was like, oh Lord, we had to cut that speaking off. Quit wasting water. <laughs> What is, what is, what is the, 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 the lesson here? When God does something for us, we need to be sure and remember it because of his goodness and not ours. And then verse 18 says, not only to remember it, look at what it says, but do what is right in the sight of God. See, when you talk about being obedient and, and living in daily obedience, we got to be sure to remember God's command. And then the implementation of that comes across in our behavior. we got to do what's right in the sight of God. Verse 24, listen to how he seals the deal. And let me give you the application of this. The Lord commanded us today to obey all of these decrees and fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. You know, it never occurred to me until now studying this, there is a direct link between our obedience to God and our prosperity. That answers so many questions for me. You know people in your life, and I know people that are always crying and wailing and moaning, and they don't serve God. Consequently, linked with that, they're always in want. You don't always have anything. There is a direct link, and I'll talk about this one more tonight, between how obedient we are and a direct link to our prosperity. Could it be? That the way that we disobey God, we set in motion some things in our lives that just catch us and really try to grab us and keep us pulled down. Let me give you two observations and I'll make application to this. Number one, our obedience to God needs to be both deliberate and intentional. He said, be sure. It's not haphazard. It's not if you think about it. It's not happy-go-lucky. We need to be intentional about our obedience to God. Then number two, our obedience has a direct link, if you will, a connection with prosperity. Now, prosperity isn't just money. Prosperity could be in our health. Prosperity could be in a number of ways. What I'm saying here is 
Could it be that those who constantly every day <coughs> turn their back on God, turn their back on blessings that they have deliberately shunned? A while back I was going through an interesting period of my life um, on, on, on my job and I just decided to take a stand and just God is just going to have to work this situation out. People around me were looking. There was a one guy who's no longer there now, caught me in the elevator. He said, man, I see what they're doing to you. How can you just take that? Why aren't you mad? What are you, why aren't you just fighting? I said, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. And it was a short ride on the elevator. We came out, and he just started crying. He just started crying. He said, can I talk to you for a moment? We sat down on the little bench. Where, where's the beaver? Beaver girl. We were we were in the connection between uh, Cook and Old Main. We sat on that bench right there. Okay, and he just cried. He and his wife were going through some tough times then, and um, he just needed somebody to talk to. And if it wasn't for the fact that I wasn't fighting and kicking and going through all of this, I just let happen. What was going to happen? God delivered me from that situation, and I was able to talk to him and give him some encouragement that God is not going to forsake you, but you're going to have to serve him as well. See, there's a direct link. If you talk about love-based obedience, there is a direct link between love, Deuteronomy 6, and obedience. The love of God is real, it's powerful, and it's transformational. It shapes us as people into who we want to live for him. See, the gospel does some interesting things. It, 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 if I'm obedient to God in my life, the gospel will then transform from what I want to do to what God wants of me. Not everybody's going to make that, make that leap. And uh, obedience is the barometer that we use to measure our love when it comes to God. What do I mean by that? If you say you love God, yet your life isn't indicating submission to God, then I got a question. Are you really obeying what God wants you to do? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Verse 25, the rain came. And, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and they beat against the house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. And he says, verse 26, but to the contrary, everyone who hears these sayings of mine, or these words of mine, and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And King James, I like the way it says, and great was the fall of it. The lesson in this text is really quite simple. The wise person is obedient to the word of God. And I'm not just talking about, oh, the Bible commands me to give, so I'll give. Oh, the Bible says come to worship, I'll come to worship. Oh, we got to gather around here. That's not what I'm just, that's a facet of it. But as a Christian, guys, you and I, our life needs to demonstrate openly and publicly devotion and service to our Lord. When the trials and the temptations come, and they will, that house is not going to fall. It's secure because the foundation is solid. Contrary, the foolish person on the other hand in this text hears the word of the Lord, but they do not act on it. Uh, this person too is inundated with trouble and hard times have no foundation, and because it has no foundation, it collapses. Obedience is literally the foundation of the Christian life. No obedience, no foundation. Unless we're living obedient to what God says, we have nothing upon which to build our lives, nothing upon which to rest in assurance, and nothing to rely on when we are tested. The last ice storm, the last snowstorm, the last cold weather snap should have taught us a number of things. It taught me a number of things. Be prepared, number one. Number two, don't take what you have for granted or take it lightly. Number three, 
Check on your neighbors. Give where you have the opportunity to give. One friend of mine in town whose mom is on oxygen, the power went out. And they, don't, they didn't have a way for her oxygen tank to, to, to have power so she could breathe. Mom had breathing problems. So she put a note on Facebook. Hey, does anybody have a spare generator or something we can power within minutes? Minutes. She had three offers for three generators. She took the one that was nearest her, and mom's breathing was able to be subsided. We have to check on our neighbors. We have to look out for each other, not just during hard, catastrophic times. For us as Christians, guys, that ought to be in our DNA. I made a lot of phone calls checking on people, and I got phone calls of people checking on me. That is the Christian way. When you talk about three things in Matthew 7 that really test your loyalty and your obedience to him, here's how you do it. Number one, we got to trust him. Number two, we have to follow him. And number three, we have to obey him. Now, don't do with God the way I did with my parents. They asked me to do something, I asked why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just saying, don't do Trust me. That's a bad idea. Okay? Bad idea. With God, we don't need the why questions answered. God says, do it. We should do it. God says, this is the way it is. We should obey. But I don't know what it is about us. We get a stubborn streak in us sometimes. And we want to ask why. And we ask why not to get the knowledge or the answer to the question. Sometimes we're just trying to be flipped. Y'all know what I mean when I say that? <laughs> we don't, we're just trying to be, don't do that. Not with God. Don't, don't do that. Our life needs to be in humble submission to God. When you talk, the, you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, you talk about the word obey, they're, they're both translated from both a Greek language and a Hebrew language, the idea of hearing. Now don't, don't take this the way my children took hearing when they were growing up. It's not selective hearing. You don't hear what you want and then forget what you don't. That's not it when it comes to God. We hear with the intent to act on it and to obey. Obedience is positive. It's an active response to listening to the word of God. Luke chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You can find a choice there. You can hear it and discard it, but if you're wise, you can hear it and then keep it. The key is actually on hearing. Let me wind it up this way. The only reliable means that we have to measure our love for God and examine is to examine whether or not we are obeying Him. Now, you might act like you're doing it. You might dress up the part. You might act the part. You might look like you're doing uh, Christian deeds. But none of these things prove that we genuinely love God. Obedience, true dedication and obedience is the only way to show that we truly love God. Listen to scripture. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is one who loves me. The one who loves me will uh, be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And then, this is John 14, in that same chapter, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who has sent me. So if you really want to know in your life, are, are, you, are you connected? Are you living daily in the love of God? It's a simple question. Very simple. How obedient to God are you? Or are you just going and doing your own thing and saying, God, I turn my nose up at you, I put thumb up at you, and I do what I want, and when I come to church, I act like everything. No, no. Daily obedience to him. The relationship between love and obedience is easy to see. If we truly love God, we'll seek to know him and to keep his commandments. If we're not keeping his commandments, then can we honestly say that we 
love him. We end like this. Actions speak louder than words. When we obey God, we prove to him that we love him. The times that I went to the store and I got things for my mother or got things for my father, as I got older and I learned what mom and dad liked, they used to make a candy bar. I don't know if they still do or not since I'm not eating as much chocolate. I'm not eating any because I want to. Oh, y'all pray for me. <laughs> they used to make a candy bar called Mr. Good Bar, and I don't know if they still make that or not. It comes in a yellow pack. Do they still? Okay. I don't know either. Thank you. <laughs> Mother used to love those candy bars. Even though she didn't ask me to get it when I got a little older, when I got everything she wanted to get on the list, I said, oh, I need to get one of those Mr. Good Bars. And I bring it home. I said, Mom, here you go. Um, I, I know you like these. Okay, I wasn't trying to curry favors. I wasn't trying to earn brownie points. I learned my mom and appreciated my mom enough because of what she'd done for me. She liked Mr. Good Bar, so there you go. I'll give you a Mr. Good Bar. That's the analogy I want you to, I want to leave you with. We need to be so in love with God and so close to God till we want to please him beyond what he says for us to do. Romans 6, but thanks be to God that you have used, you used to be slaves to sin, but you have uh, come to obey from your heart uh, the pattern of teaching. King James there says the form of doctrine that you have now claimed as your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and you become slaves for righteousness. We need to get Stay in, in love with God so much, the more we learn Him, the more we're in the relationship with Him, the more we want to please Him beyond what He has commanded us to do. Tonight, online, stay with me. Let's look at Acts chapter 5, the case of Ananias and Sapphira. And I'm calling, I'm calling this one an example of insecure obedience. See, there's one thing to be obedient. It's another thing to be downright dastardly and say you obey and you really don't. That's Acts 5. And we'll look at that online tonight. We'll start next month, the month of March. Um, our new theme will be questions that God asks. Godly questions for godly living. And there are four. And I'll give them to you and I'll take one each week, and we'll look at questions that God asks. God asks some godly questions in the Old Testament and the New Testament that prompts us, that, that signals us for godly living. But you know, again, an opportunity, and we, get, we do this every time we meet because it's important, um, is an opportunity for us to get right in our relationship with Him. See, it doesn't do any good to point out uh, the wrong in scripture without giving us a chance to get right when it comes to our relationship with him. Maybe maybe this week you've, you, you've been disobedient. You've been rebellious when it comes to your relationship with God. You've been acting like everything's fine. I wouldn't leave this building today. If that's the case, I wouldn't leave this building today in that same separated state when it comes to you and your relationship with God. Maybe there's a prayer need that you have. Maybe you need us to pray for you for strength. Maybe, maybe there's some things you're grappling with that you really have decided, I can't handle this on my own. Lord, I need you. I need you now more than ever. Maybe you want to repent. Maybe you're saying, God, you know, I haven't been as close to you as I really need to be. And I <coughs> repent. And I, I need you, Lord, now in my life more than ever. Or perhaps... <coughs> You've come to a point in your life where your relationship with God isn't what it should be, or you want to begin your relationship with God. You come by hearing his word, by believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ, and being willing to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. And based on that act of obedience, God then adds you to his congregational family. If you're already a member and you have a prayer need or a prayer request, we invite you to come make that known. We don't need all the sort of details. All we need to do is know that you have a prayer need and we'll certainly take that to God on your behalf. If you have a, a need that we need to pray for, a need that we need to meet, we ask you now to come make that known as we stand and sing the words to the invitation song.